All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar this morning on our final coffee and compliance of 2022. Um, today, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's an all mapistry team on the webinar today, and we're going to talk a little bit about some questions we've seen online about the environmental industry, EHS in general, and also look forward to 2023 in terms of what are the trends, what are the major issues out there that we're, we're all keeping track of internally that we thought it would be valuable to share with us. Um, super excited to have Courtney, who's our senior sales engineer on. She comes from an environmental background like myself uh, with many, many years in the consulting space before transitioning to the tech sector, working with us at Map History. Um, so she's got a very uh, diverse and unique perspective on both the environmental industry, but also how it's transforming on the tech side and in particular on e in-house EHS teams. Um, and then Julianne's our growth marketing manager. We're welcoming her to our first webinar and she usually runs our podcast and a bunch of other um, channels here at Mapistry. So she's gonna be our moderator today for the questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julianne. Thank you. Um, so we are just going to get right into it and start with the questions. So Courtney, let's start with you. Um, the first question that was asked is, what is the impact of the economy on the in-house EH EHS teams? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. The economy, I think, has a lot of us um, really stressed out. We all wish we had crystal balls right now, but I think it's going to be that same Thing we've felt in the past where EHS teams are going to need to do more with less. Um, there's going to be, I think, investments towards um, e, um, like the ESG spending. So they're going to want to shift maybe some budgets over towards ESG and the environmental teams are going to have to figure out uh, maybe how to pick up some of that. Um, and I think we're already seeing a lot of um, environmental teams uh, get their budgets slashed or not getting the budget increases they hoped for next year. I think because some of that is just the tightening economy and some of that is the need to spend it um, over in that ESG space. So, Ryan, would you? Yeah, you've got a good point on the like budget cuts. And I think what I've seen is there'll be a mandate usually from like CFO office of cut 10 to 15 percent across the board cuts. And I think that's particularly problematic as anybody on this webinar knows and all of us is you're always being asked to do EHS and compliance and environmental with far, far less. So to just take another 10 or 15% off budgets is really, really tough. Um, the other factor we've seen as you shift either jobs around within a company or it, although we're seeing still um, high, you know, inflation's it looks like from the, the numbers this morning leveling off a little bit, but um, still, the Java market is really, really good. So there's high unemployment. So you're you're probably understaffed. So the economy, because of the job market, you're probably understaffed. So if you're relying on like operations or production folks to do some of the environmental stuff, that's another kind of tax on the EA, EHS teams we're seeing with this current economy, which is weird because there's concerns about, like you said, Courtney, of like, are we going into a recession? What's the what you know? What are our customers as a manufacturer or, or transportation company going to do? So we want to reduce spending, but we can't fill these jobs that we have openings for, and we've got more work than ever it seems in a lot of sectors. So it's a very weird time, and I think um, it's tough to say take 15% off the EHS budget. No, by the way, your workload's doubled, and you have less frontline field people to do it. So. Um, yeah, 2023 is going to be interesting for, for EHS teams and just for the economy in general. It, it's an interesting up and down uh, that we're seeing there. Yeah, so, I mean, besides the economy, what other challenges or frustrations um, are environmental teams currently dealing with when it comes to managing their data? Courtney, you're, you're the one in the data more than I am day in, day out. So why don't you jump into this one first? Yeah, I think the biggest frustration oftentimes is just too much data. There's there's so much to keep track of and it's, you know, like more data, more problems. There's too much, too much data. It's coming in at them just like from all directions, lab reports, inspection reports. So I think one of the biggest frustrations is just, just too much data and not necessarily knowing where to find the current data or the current versions of it. 
Um, and then the manual manipulation that has to happen with so much that data makes it so easy to make mistakes. So if you're copying stuff in um, to Excel, you have to make sure you copy it in properly. So I think, again, just, just having way too much data, big frustration is it's, it's too much data coming at you from too many different places and it increases the chance for errors. Yeah, thank you. Um... Well, we're going to flip it over a little bit. If you guys have ever looked at Mapistry's LinkedIn, you know that I love looking um, at the news and being super up to date with that. So on that note, what do you think stands out as the top environmental news of 2022, a look back of this year? Um, Ryan, let's have you take this one. <laughs> Get yeah. Courtney out of the hot seat first. <laughs> yeah, I think there's there. it's kind of tied to what is in the top news and then I know we've got coming up a question on like what do we see for trends in 2023 to me they're somewhat related i think there's a couple big news one big news story that i think is interesting um in terms of there was a ceo that went to jail um for 36 months for submitting hundreds of false monitoring reports i think for the map history team that really caught our eye is we see about we we've courtney and i've been involved in litigation on like helping defend people on citizen lawsuits so we're we're familiar with the civil aspect the criminal aspect i think is one of those things that caught our attention um in particular for me of understanding that like department of justice is really going after people for this reporting and as courtney was mentioning like a lot of data um it starts to be interesting around the like criminal liability the other one tied to that is at our annual conference one of the attorneys presented on um, an accident that they actually held the environmental coordinator liable for, um, and I believe it was criminal charges in either probation or jail time for it. They didn't go after the company, they went after like the environmental coordinator, or EHS coordinator, which is another really kind of scary thought when we go back to question one, what is the impact? Um, because if you're being asked to do all this stuff with less budget and you don't have as much maybe power to say to frontline production folks to come to a training or fill out a form, but then you're held liable for that. In this case, it was a safety chemical mixing hazards accident um, that resulted in an explosion. And they found that the EHS coordinator really hadn't done enough on training to what they met, they thought were the right standards. Uh, for anybody that's like responsible for doing EHS training, you know how hard it is to get people there, show up, pay attention. The fact that you might be criminally liable. That plus like DMRs or discharge monitoring reports, the CEO going to jail for falsifying lab reports. Those two things I think elevated in my mind what to pay attention to around training, around record keeping, around um, inspections, around data reporting and like the personal liability aspect that I don't know I was focused on as much um, in the past, especially around criminal charges. So those are the two things that really stood out to me in 2022 of things to pay attention to. And I'll talk a little bit more how it relates to what to pay attention to in 2023, but I think it's, it, we can't just check the box anymore. And there's actual hard consequences for just checking the box um, that we saw in 2022. Yeah, I was kind of shocked when I was um, doing some of the news updates, like how many specific people instead of companies are getting held liable, which I feel like you usually kind of think you can hide behind your company a little bit when it comes to um, fines and lawsuits, but you clearly can't, which is must be a little terrifying and hard if you like make a mistake. So I think making sure that you don't make mistakes is super important um, and trying to not like slip through the cracks at all. Yeah, um, I, also, oh, I was going to say, I'd also had that Tennessee CEO as the top, the new story that just stands out to me, the falsifying reports. Um, and again, I think it speaks to like just the too much data. I believe she was a consulting. So she was doing this on behalf of other companies. So, you know, making sure if you are working with consultants that you are still checking up on them. Um, but just, yeah, this idea that that there's maybe too much data for us in the industry to really manage like proactively right now. And it can be a really stressful situation for a lot of people. Yeah, um, so in terms of 2023, we'll have both of you answer this question. What do you think folks should be paying attention to? Ryan, let's start, let's start with you. 
I think the data thing is number one. Um, we had a coffee and compliance a little back talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and how much money was in that for public data sets, the EPA, um, you know, promoting visibility and transparency on environmental data to the general public that builds on a trend we've seen with environmental groups, even EPA, EPA's EJ screen, environmental justice screening tool with maps and data. So I think number one trend is the public availability and accessibility of data and our, you know, how we counsel people in terms of strategies of like understanding, like you said, Courtney, nothing falls through the cracks. You have better ways to manage that. So public data access and transparency is one of the top trends I see. Kind of related to that is the emergence of 6PPD uh, quinone, um, which is an emerging contaminant. We've talked a lot about PFAS. There's, uh, that's one of the other trends to pay attention to, but every environmental conference now has PFAS as a topic. I mean, we've done it ourselves, so like we're, 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 we're guilty of this too. I think it'll continue to be an issue, but we have to look more carefully at other emerging contaminants and the research coming out of the West Coast on the coho salmon on the impacts of 6-PPD quinone in tires and on stormwater and other water discharge permits, I think will be really interesting. How does that come into play? stormwater and PDS permits have a five-year cycle. Will they start regulating under it faster than that and do amendments? Um, so something to pay attention to, and I think one of the trends, as a, or as a takeaway from one of the trends, is really what are companies doing to more proactively monitor for emerging contaminants or think about where things are coming um, from in their manufacturing process? And that ties to PFAS as part of the National Defense Authorization Act that um, was put out recently. One of the things they're looking to do with PFAS is make it reportable under TRI. So previously there was an exemption um, under TRI that for PFAS you could say it was de minimis. So, you know, basically non-existent. They're in for and but they didn't get many people reporting PFAS, even though it's ubiquitous in the environment and manufacturing. Um, processes. So they're going to push, they being federal government, EPA, DOJ, on the reporting of PFAS through TRI. It's another one of those emerging contaminants. The, the risk for companies to pay attention to is as you start having or you're mandated to report something like PFAS, if you say there's nothing but then you have it, it goes back to that liability and the personal liability. So all these things are, are interrelated to some extent. So I think Pay attention to public data, um, emerging contaminants, 6-PPDD quinone, and then PFAS. Um, and then the final thing, another hot topic, ESG sustainability. Um, you know, the US, the UK, the EU all have requirements around it. We're seeing more private companies do it. Um, but we're now seeing, um, as of yesterday, Australia doesn't have ESG required. They just put out uh, a proposal similar to the SEC's requirements in the US around companies reporting for ESG and sustainability. The fact that it's tying it to financial also increases the liability. So just pay attention to the nexus between ESG sustainability reporting and your liability or company financial liability. So those are my top three, four uh, emerging issues and things to pay attention to in 2023. Courtney, is there anything you think you missed? I don't think you missed anything. That was, um, I think, yeah, shifting budgets towards ESG is something to focus on and think about how your environmental team can kind of collaborate and share resources um, to meet those ESG objectives also. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, dissatisfaction seems to be growing in environmental jobs. Were your early environmental jobs what you expected when you took them? We knew we would be getting into like litigation and policy debates right right out of school. That's exactly what we knew we'd be touching on as part of in science. Um, yeah, my my first job, I guess I was shocked how much writing I would have to do. I mean, I obviously went into engineering because I prefer math over writing and it was all technical report writing. So that was that was something I did not expect was just how many how much of my time would be spent doing technical report writing as well as like how much of my time would be spent just moving data between one spreadsheet and another and pulling data out of GIS or pulling data out of lab reports and trying to um, make it all work work together. Yeah. 
Um, why why do you think the dissatisfaction? Sorry, I can't say that word. Dissatisfaction seems to be growing in environmental jobs. I think I you know what word I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it goes to that trying to get more out of less, like expecting um, your team to just get the job done, even though it might take 60 hours a week to do it and not um, really respecting the balance that people need to have satisfaction in their life overall. So I think a lot of it is is just like an expectation that the low level, entry level employees like put in the hours and put in the time, but they're not going to see any real benefit from it for 10, 15 years until they're in the management and sales side. Um, and then, sorry, I'm like, my next thought slipped from me. Um, so I'll I let what? Yeah, I mean, Courtney, building on that, I think we both experience this. We both have spent time early on in our careers in environmental consulting. And like you, you put in the hours, but the model similar to the legal profession is billable hours. So there's no incentive to like have an entry level environmental consultant really do anything other than rack up billable hours because the multiples like pay somebody 30, 40 bucks an hour is uh, entry level consultant and then that they are doing data entry and there's no incentive to like give them tools necessarily or start thinking like how do we move them this highly qualified person at least with educational background into a role where you can start thinking around analysis or engineering design or strategy and it tends to be very just like data entry uh a lot of driving around some field work those type of things so i think that can burn people out pretty early on especially if you're looking at like you said a 10 15 year career kind of doing that until you get to the fun stuff that we all went to engineering school and i think um you know that was one of my frustrations early on career wise is just you've got to be able to like do more problem solving earlier in your career and and there's a big piece of that kind of like brute force data collection, cleaning data, analysis, writing, all of that. But also like there's a lot of problem solving that makes the job really fun. So how do how do we get back to that? And I think Courtney, I mean, my my view is like one of the ways is how do we automate a lot of that with technology or get better tools in place um, so that I can spend 10%, 15, 25% early in my career of the time actually using those tools and doing analysis rather than just crunching numbers in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Something I've heard on some of the trips I've gone on um, talking to people is a lack of organization, a lack of communication. Um, when someone quits or you know gets let go, they have all the information and they didn't let everyone else know. Um, so it just kind of feels a little bit like a mess instead of an organized mess. I mean, I know that the industry unfortunately always has a fire to burn out, but I think as long as it's an organized chaos, um, that makes a satisfaction, I can't say that word. <laughs> um, satisfaction. <laughs> satisfaction um, mm -hmm. and a job a lot higher when you feel like the chaos is somewhat organized. And I think that that's a huge part of um, this industry that technology has helped it but then if you work for a company that isn't keeping up with technology that can be kind of hard because you compare yourself to some of your friends who um they're starting to get super organized and that probably can be kind of frustrating too um yeah i think we also have so much technology that we rely on like in our just personal lives from like banking to shared family calendars um and that it's weird to go to your job and feel like you don't have the tools you have in your personal life that they send you out with with paper or they um i mean this was years back but they were like no we're not going to pay for wi-fi on the plane like that's not a billable <laughs> expense and i'm like okay i'll just sit on a plane for four hours and really not have anything to do so like this handicapping like not providing you the tools because they view them as expenses when we could be getting so much more out of our time with the right with the right tools yeah 
So Courtney, I've got a question for you. What was your biggest like hack um, when you were in environmental consulting to accomplish something? Did you ever, like what did you cobble together to, to make it work or make it more efficient? Well, my favorite hack that everybody loved was I built my own, um, I like, I'm not a computer scientist, but I can hack almost anything in Excel with the visual basic language, but I built a PDF compiler so you could just check off which fact sheets you needed for your SWIP and it would put them all into one PDF for you because I was really sick of um, putting PDFs together. <laughs> I did that on like a Friday night. My my husband's in um, tech and knows how to code, so I did use my in-house tech support a little to get it finished. <laughs> You're actually hours yeah. of Friday night. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean that was the. I mean, Mapistry is is one of those hacks of like I got so fed up with ArcGIS map updates on like tracking waste disposal for stockpiles of contaminated soil that. I was like, I'm done building 14 hours a day making map updates. Let's go build a company around it. So, well, in your opinion, then, Courtney, is it? Do you think um, it's better to be in a consulting role or an in-house EHS role? Um, tech role would be the best option. Um, just kidding. I mean, Ryan and I both switched over to tech because uh, consulting was. Um, not fitting to our personality i think it's it really it's a personality thing so i think uh, either option could, could be great for the right person um early in your career like if you're looking at your first job i would just want to know what all am i going to get exposure to and try and get as much exposure so i know um a lot of the bigger companies the in-house ehs roles have uh like rotation programs so you can learn a ton in your first two years um, just make sure wherever you're going, you're not going to get pigeonholed into doing one thing over and over. Um, and then it's important to know with consulting, you're going to be doing sales eventually in your career. And that's got to be something um, that excites you. But to be really successful in consulting, you you have to be selling. So, yeah. Um, next question for um both of you, but Courtney, we can start with you. What do you think is the most risky environmental area in 2023 for companies, water versus air? Oh, um, <laughs> and you're biased because you are you have a water background. <laughs> I have a water background, so yeah, admittedly, maybe I'm not fully versed on air issues, um, but I do, rem I mean, I did read something earlier this year that, you know, of course, that like, supported my own bias but it said like there's we're really undervaluing the risk of water so and water from a pollution standpoint but also from a resource standpoint like are we going to run out of water how can we better recycle our water so i think you know we we think about water pollution so much but i really think water as a resource is something that's underappreciated as a risk um, to, to companies. Well, a lot of the um, lawsuits and fines that I've seen over the past year and my news updates have been stormwater violations or have been some sort of violation that was on the water side. Um, so it seems like those are more hefty fines that um, at least I've seen the past year than some of the other some of the other things that we have to keep track of. So clearly the government cares a lot about um, water. Ryan, what do you Got think it. is the, the riskiest? It's a tough one. I agree, like historically air has always been a tough one. We see even just like NOBs, you didn't have bag house inspections or you didn't file a report. I think with the emergence of ESG and sustainability reporting, like greenhouse gas reporting will become more critical. I think. Courtney's right, the kind of like iceberg to the Titanic, kind of the lurking thing that nobody's really paying attention to is water. And one is if we move, if the um, Secur Securities Exchange Commission moves to ESG reporting for public companies um, and there's more penalties and the potential for shareholder lawsuits on it, there's gonna be more scrutiny on what you're putting in those sustainability reports. And water is actually a huge component of it that because it's been under 
appreciated under draft. Like you can look at your natural gas usage or your electricity bill and it's gonna be through accounting and you can run a greenhouse gas uh, calculation on it. I think water has a higher risk of frankly data being made up or it's like, yeah, 20 years ago we made this spreadsheet. We're not sure if it's right. And then the stuff gets compounded as you roll up from 100 or 200 or 500 facilities and you put it in your formal sustainability report, but the underlying data is just junk. And then if that um, kind of unfolds in a shareholder lawsuit that you were off by an order of magnitude on like your water reporting, the same for the emerging contaminants, which is a little bit more immediate, um, but I don't think people are paying enough attention. So I am biased. I am a water person at heart, even though I've done stuff on the air side and been involved in that. Um, I still think water is an under underrecognized, very risky area that I think a lot of companies we're seeing are paying significantly more attention to. Yeah, um, so two more questions. I have one more that I just thought of while asking all of you guys these. What do you think is the biggest hesitation for people to be a bit more like progressive and move forward and why people don't get software or get kind of more with what's going on currently with technology like what is the hesitation is it just kind of stuck in your own ways or do you think it's um do you think it's liking what they're doing now or fear or that they don't realize the cost benefit um what is what is both your opinions on that one i don't think they like what they're doing now but generally like environmental managers in this role, you're rewarded for not drawing attention to yourself. So you don't want um, you don't want violations. You don't want you know e e the less attention you have, the kind of better you're doing your job. So I think it's hard for them. It's hard to go ask for what you need and draw attention to yourself that way. Um, I also think they just like it's a big change management project, and it's it's outside of. Um, maybe what they're what people are used to doing to to bring about this kind of organizational change uh, it's it's tough to kind of gather the resources to make the business case especially if ehs budgets historically have been like air pollution control equipment sampling costs and people and it's like a deviation from that it's you'll get the the question of like why and i think you're right courtney people want better tools for all the reasons we listed if you're in the EHS world, you can see it coming. You can see everything blowing at you. The, the hard part is convincing others that aren't in it, like, what the heck is going on? Why is this? We've all we've always done it this way and never gotten a violation. Like risk mitigation is really hard to to quantify and share. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's communicating the value, the technology or change, and and then getting everybody else, uh, execs. Uh, peers in other departments and folks frontline all on the same page. That's a hard job. Uh, mm -hmm. Change management stuff just in any field, but I think environmental is one of those things that hasn't had a lot of change, so it makes it harder. Yeah, and it's usually the guys that want it the most sometimes at the beginning who aren't in um, sometimes the the role to be able to do that change. So I think having to convince your manager, then convince his manager, then his, then his, then his. <laughs> Um, that can be hard, and sometimes um, if you don't have a team behind you or um, exact data that's like easy to find and easy to show, that can be a little challenging. But um, I think it's definitely there and definitely worth it. Um, but if you were uh, Fry and or Courtney, you guys don't have any last final thoughts. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone has such a great day, and I will be sharing both of these copies on the webinar um, on our website and on our park podcast, EHS Aligned. Um, you can check it out on our website at www.mapistry.com slash podcast. So I hope everyone has such a great day and um, let us know on LinkedIn if you have any more questions that we didn't get answered. Thanks all. Bye everyone.